members and regular attenders to get a reading on where you might be in regards to uh, in-person worship. So please check your email and take the short survey. It will help us greatly. In the meanwhile, we'll continue to connect with each other uh, through the media of Zoom. So small groups and men's and women's Bible studies um, will continue to proceed uh, through Zoom. Uh, you are also on your own welcome to get together with folks in the church, friends and family, as uh, our state is opening up more and more to larger gatherings. Uh, if you're missing folks from Walnut Creek, then uh, we encourage you to get together with folks um, at Walnut Creek uh, at your place. If you do want to join any of the online meetings that we have, please go to wcpc.org and get a listing um, from there. We also want to thank you for your faithful and generous support, uh, financial support of Walnut Creek. Um, we are in a very healthy financial state, and thank you very much. You can continue to give online. Uh, the link is provided for you. Uh, you can send your check in by snail mail as well. If you're on Facebook Live right now, please offer some comments. Check in and say hello uh, to us. If you feel comfortable sharing a prayer request with everyone, please do so. We want to pray with and for you. I'm going to ask you to join me once again in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 21. Uh, we are continuing our, ser our series in this book, and we come to a transition point in the story. It is the final transition point in the last section of this book as Paul heads towards Rome with the message of the gospel. And so I'm going to ask you to join me in Acts chapter 21, and in just a moment, I will read from two sections of this chapter. But before the reading of God's word, I'm going to invite you to join me in singing uh, this prayer as we approach the scripture that God has given to us. Open my eyes and I shall see. Incline my heart and I shall desire. Order my steps, and I shall walk in the ways of your commandments. Open my eyes, and I shall see Incline my heart, and I shall desire. Order my steps, and I shall walk in the ways of your commandments. Acts 21, verse 7. Hear now the word of the Lord. When he had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived in Ptolemais, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we de departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. And then verse 26. 
This is after Paul has traveled to Jerusalem. He's met with some of the believers there, and and he now is uh, fulfilling a vow and a ritual in relationship to the temple in Jerusalem. So verse 26, then Paul took them in, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would take the reading and teaching of your word and by your spirit make it effective in our lives. You would open our eyes and our ears to receive what you say and the presence and work of your spirit and that we would be changed by you today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. One of my favorite musicians and songwriters, Jason Isbell, released an album this week. And there's a song on that album titled, Be Afraid. And it's kind of an anthem for artistic bravery. Uh, for artists to, to take a stand and, and be willing to take the risk of being creative. And in the chorus of that song, he sings, Be afraid, be very afraid, but do it anyway. Be afraid, be very afraid, but do it anyway. I feel like that could be the theme song of the Apostle Paul's career. And especially this moment we read about in Acts chapter 21. Paul has been traveling around the world preaching the gospel and planting churches. But now he chooses to go to Jerusalem and through Jerusalem, through what happens in Jerusalem, to Rome. And as he travels to Jerusalem, he knows that something bad will happen there. The Spirit had revealed that to him. The Spirit had revealed that to others, including this prophet Agabus. And so everyone around Paul is saying, don't go, don't go to Jerusalem. Be afraid, be very afraid. But Paul does it anyway. He goes to Jerusalem and he's arrested. An arrest that will lead to an extended trial and ultimately to his death. Why does he do that? Why does Paul move towards the possibility of pain rather than away from it? That's not just an interesting question about a character in the Bible. That is a vital question for our lives. Because if we are going to live the kind of lives that Jesus wants us to live, in the language of Acts, if we are going to live lives that bear witness to him and his kingdom, if we're going to do that, it will not be easy. 
it will hurt. We will most certainly face painful resistance to that kind of life. Be afraid. Be very afraid. So, why would we do it anyway? If this is true, why would we move towards the possibility of pain rather than away from it? That's the question I want to bring to this story this morning. And we'll look at this story and find two reasons. We should risk the pain of following Jesus because of a pattern and a purpose. So first of all, the pattern. As Luke, the narrator in the book of Acts, as he tells the story of Paul, he wants us to hear the story of Jesus. So remember Jesus, before he dies, right before he dies, he determines to go to Jerusalem. Even those all around him, his friends, warn him not to do that. They they try to stop him from doing that because they know that something bad will happen there. And Jesus, when he gets to Jerusalem, do you remember what he does? Well, he goes to the temple and he cleanses it by chasing away the corrupt vendors. Hear the echo in Acts 21, the themes of purity and the temple in the second half of this chapter. Jesus was arrested by Jewish authority and then handed over to Roman authorities as the mob cried out, crucify him. Paul, arrested by Jewish authority, handed over to Roman authorities as the mob cries out, away with him. You see it? Do you see the pattern Paul walks towards suffering in Jerusalem because he is walking in the steps of Jesus. The movement of his life is determined by the movement of Jesus towards the cross. And that's not just a pattern for Paul as an individual. You remember Jesus on the night before he's crucified? Remember how he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was feeling the weight of what was about to happen and he was praying. And as he prayed, what did he say? He said, Father, I'd rather not do this. I I wish this cup could pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Acts chapter 21, verse 14. The church, the community around Paul is feeling the weight of what is about to happen and they don't want it to happen. They say, don't go. Then Paul says, I'm going. And then what do they say? Let the will of the Lord be done. See, this surrendered movement towards suffering is not just a movement for elite, special, extra spiritual individuals. It is for all who are in Jesus. It is for the church. And this pattern, it is for us. Most of you know that we moved here from Florida a couple of years ago. And during our first year in Ohio, back in Ohio, when the weather turned cold, our youngest son one day came flying down the stairs from his room with a concerned look on his face. And we said, Sam, what's the matter? What's wrong? And he said, there's hot air pouring out of my air conditioner. You see, he hadn't experienced that. He didn't expect that. And so we said to him, that's normal. That's to be expected because of our new location here in Ohio. We can be like that. When obeying Jesus isn't easy, 
when not everyone around us is in love with the Christian message and the Christian way of life? We can be a little bit like that, shocked and offended and undone. But hear the pattern. See the pattern in the book of Acts and throughout Scripture. Suffering is to be expected because of our new location. See, our lives are now located in Jesus. And to belong to Jesus is to belong to this movement towards the cross. Didn't Jesus himself say it? He said, if you're going to walk in my direction, what do you have to do? You have to take up your cross. You have to take up the risk of rejection, of pain, of loss in order to follow me. Now, if anything, we have made our question worse. If the pattern of the cross is inherent to the claim that Jesus makes on our life, why would we submit to that claim? Why would we want anything to do with Jesus and the life he calls us to? Well, back to this story and notice a second reason, not only a pattern, but a purpose. And to see this purpose, we have to see the geography of Acts chapter 21. Remember, Paul's ultimate goal is to go to Rome and even beyond Rome, further westward to Spain. But there were much quicker and easier routes to do that than the one that he takes in this chapter. And and if his goal was to get arrested, there were a number of cities where that could have happened. Paul had made a lot of trouble in his ministry. So why Jerusalem? Why does Paul go through Jerusalem to Rome? Well, remember that this city is where the story began. It's where the story of Acts began. Jesus, as he's ascending into heaven, says to his disciples, go to that city, go to Jerusalem, and wait until you receive power, until you receive my spirit, and then you will be my witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. In Acts 21, Paul reverses that movement and he comes back to the beginning. Why? Well, because in the beginning, we find the end. We find the purpose of his life and mission. There's a lot I could say about the history and symbolism of Jerusalem But the most significant aspect of this city, and it's the aspect that Luke wants us to see, the most significant aspect of this city was the temple at its center. So notice Paul travels by way of Tyre. If you know the story of the Old Testament, you know that the materials for the building of the temple came from that port city. Another way that Luke is saying, pay attention to the temple. That's where the purpose is found. And the temple represented access to God. And it represented access to the fullness of life that comes from being in the presence of God. But it also represented the limits to that access. Who could have it and how close they could come. So notice the accusation against Paul in verse 28. What's he doing wrong? Well, he's bringing the wrong people into the temple. He is giving the wrong people access. He is bringing dirty Gentiles too close 
and defiling the holy place. Now remember, the story of Paul is connected to the story of Jesus. And remember, like Paul, Jesus came to the temple right before his death. And he cleansed the temple, taking a whip and chasing away the salesmen of religion. And what does he yell as he chases them out of the temple? Well, he yells a quote from the prophet Isaiah. And he says, this house, this is supposed to be a house for all peoples. Not just a select privileged group. This is supposed to be a house for, of prayer for all nations. See, God's vision for the temple is that it would be changed. It was a vision he gave to the prophet Isaiah that the access which the temple represented, that that access would be opened to all people everywhere. And what Jesus is doing as he cracks the whip and shouts this message is he is saying, I am implementing that vision. I am beginning that change. I am changing the nature of access to God and the life that comes from him, which is why as Jesus takes his last breath on the cross and as he cries out, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit, the veil that limited access to the most holy place was ripped from top to bottom. Another Old Testament prophet saw it a different way. God gave Ezekiel the the vision of a radically expanded cosmic temple and out of that structure was flowing a river that flowed in all directions and brought the living, healing water of God to the nations. So as Jesus died, in that moment, as that veil ripped from top to bottom. The water of God began to flow over the dam and flood all of creation. It began to bring God's life and healing to all peoples everywhere. So do you see why Paul goes to Jerusalem, goes to the temple, He is reenacting and reaffirming that vision. Paul goes to Jerusalem because he is part of the river. He is part of the flood. He is willing to be bound and beaten so that he can announce and enact the freedom and the healing of a renewed access to God and the life that comes from him. See, his accusers almost had it right. But Paul wasn't bringing Gentiles into the temple. He was bringing the temple to the Gentiles with the message about Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit. See, Paul can embrace the pattern of Jesus because he had been embraced by the purpose of Jesus to bring life and healing to all people everywhere. And as with that pattern, so the purpose isn't limited to just Paul as a unique individual. It is a purpose for all of those who are in Jesus. It is a purpose for your life, for my life, for our life together, Walnut Creek. And we long for that, we want that, We want to know that our lives belong to some significant mission. That is why the word essential 
has become a lightning rod in the past two months. Because if they're essential workers, what about me? What about my job? What about my life? Am I non-essential? We long for significant purpose. It's why video games can have such a powerful pull on so many people. See, in video games, you don't just watch the hero rescue the princess. You participate in that story. You participate in rescuing Zelda. Dating myself with that reference. These games offer involvement in a significant fight or in building something significant or in finding something significant. And we can do that not only as an individual now because of technology, we can do it as a group. We can do it in community and relationship. That resonates deeply with us and with how we were put together because we were put together to long for a mission a purpose, a significance. And the joy of finding that in a game is only a pale hint of the joy of finding that in the glorious purpose that Jesus has put on our lives. Like Paul, if we are in Jesus, we have been embraced by his mission. And it's not just for the elite spiritual superheroes. It's not just for missionaries, church planters, and pastors. It is for us all. We read it a few weeks ago in community Bible reading. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians says, we, all of us, we are the temple of the living God. That means your life has become an access point to the life that comes from God for the world around you. Jesus has made you a part of this life-giving river, this flood that is filling the earth. We read it this week in our community Bible reading. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 4, if you are in Jesus, you are from Jerusalem. That's your hometown but not the Jerusalem below, rather the Jerusalem above, where Jesus ascended and now reigns. You belong to that city. You belong to that fullness of God's life-giving presence. And because of that, your life, your ordinary life, your relationships, your home, your job has all become a portal an intersection between the goodness of heaven and the brokenness of this world. That's why you breathe. You breathe in order to bring God's healing rule and reign into your relationships, into your vocation, into your neighborhood, into this city, into the world. Is that how you see your life? Is that how you see your relationships, even your relationships with those people who you've been stuck in the house with for the past few months? Would you wake up tomorrow morning imagining the divine potential of your week? 
because you belong to this mission. You belong to this high purpose. And it is because of that purpose that we should be willing to embrace the pattern. We can pick up our crosses because Jesus picked up his cross and made us a part of this redeeming work that he is doing in the world. We can pray, your will be done, even that if that involves suffering, because we have prayed, your kingdom come. And know that because of Jesus, God's healing kingdom is coming in and through us. You can embrace the pattern of the cross because you have been embraced by this purpose. So if Jesus and his kingdom are going to be the aim and the direction of your life, be afraid. Be very afraid. Because he will draw you into the pattern of the cross. But... Do it anyway. Because he has made you a part of the river. He has drawn you into the flood of his healing water, bringing life to the nations. Let's pray. Father, would you help us the demand and call of Jesus on our life, if we reckon with it honestly, is a scary one. There is no way around the demand to pick up our cross in order to follow him. To embrace the possibility, even the certainty of pain and loss, rejection, resistance, in this life of trying to do what he wants us to do, bearing witness to his kingdom. Father, give us the courage to embrace that pattern, but help us to draw that courage not from our own resources, but from the incredible work that you have done of redeeming us and then involving us in this great redemptive work that you are doing. I pray that you would remind us this week of the rich purpose that you have given to our lives. Remind us that that mission connects not just to the big things, but to the small and to the ordinary. Make us a part of the river. Help us to know that Jesus 